We're asking the question. We're asking the question. What do we yet need to learn? And uh, we're hoping that our speaker for today, PJ Stevenson, will help us answer this question. Um, before we dive into the topic, just very quickly, so that everyone who might not know who RGI is, knows who's organizing this webinar and who commissioned the study that we're talking about today. Um, so uh, we are an association based in Berlin um, with a considerably unique membership structure, I would say, um, meaning it's an, a relatively unlikely combination of transmission system operators and environmental and climate NGOs. And together we work on the energy system of the future and uh, trying to bring it about as quickly as possible, as nature friendly as possible, and as socially responsible as possible. Um, and we have members from all over Europe, as you see here. And a lot of what we do is actually connected to best practice work. Um, we collect best practices mostly via our Good Practice of the Year Award, um, but we always try to share them in many, many different ways and via many different channels um, to reach as many members of our potential audience as possible. Um, this includes reports, um, showcasing best practices in our database, showing them at best practice fairs, um, and talking about them during webinars, such as we do today. Um, today is a little bit different because we're not looking at a very specific best practice, but rather on how to improve existing practices. But um, in any case, this is meant as a learning experience for everyone participating. Um, so we encourage all of you during the um, Q&A session of this webinar to just ask any question that comes to your mind. Um, yeah, and I would say with this, we dive right in and talk about uh, what's going to happen today. So um, we're going to start with a presentation by our main speaker, uh, PJ Stevenson. Um, and he's going to talk about the report that he did um, as commissioned by RGI um, and as a review of biodiversity data needs and monitoring protocols um, for the renewable energy sector in the Baltic Sea and the North Sea. And we've actually asked three different stakeholders to directly react to his presentation. And uh, we have Viviane Degré from RTE here today. She's the Marine Environmental Officer. Um, we have Antonio Volcano, who is a Marine Officer for Europe and Central Asia for BirdLife International. And Tina Tambendixen, the Lead Environment and Permitting Specialist from Ørsted. So we're having direct reactions to what PJ is presenting um, from a transmission system operator, from an NGO, and from a project developer. Um, so that we have many different stakeholder perspectives already. And then we're opening the floor after that for everyone who might have any questions. Um, some housekeeping before we actually begin. So we're recording this webinar. Um, and in the hope that many of you want to um, actively join during the Q&A session. Um, so for that portion that we know who you are, um, I'd like to ask you to rename yourself. Um, and if your name isn't shown like this, so first name, last name, organization that you represent, please go ahead and do that now. And um, generally, if you are not talking, please mute yourself just so that we avoid that everyone hears um, surrounding, surrounding noise. Um, for the portion um, that is more interactive at the end, it would be nice if many of you actually put their video on. Um, if you do talk in the interest of uh, hearing from as many people as possible, please be concise and succinct in what you're saying. And um, to show me that you want to say something that you want to contribute, please use the reactions field on the bottom right to raise your hand and then I will call on you to ask your question. Um, that's it for the housekeeping, I think. And now it's over to PJ. So to quickly introduce him, um, after spending many years working for conservation organizations, such as Conservation International, IUCN, the Scottish Nat Natural Heritage, and WWF, 
Um, PJ is now an independent conservation and sustainability consultant, um, and he's specializing in results-based management. He's also the chair of the IUCN SSC Species Monitoring Specialist Group, and he is a research fellow at the University of Lausanne. Uh, very impressive, and we're very happy to have had him for our report and to have him here today to share his findings. Um, oh, I'm having some trouble with my slides, but um, yeah. And um, as you can see here, this is the report that um, PJ researched on behalf of RGI. Um, and we're very happy to also announce today that uh, we're going to launch this report on our website um, after this webinar has ended today, and you will all be able to download it and uh, read about what PJ is presenting here today in more detail, um, share it with whoever you think might be interested in it. Uh, we'll send around an email after this webinar to share the direct link to the report um, so that you'll all be able to find it immediately. And I think that's it from my side. Um, so with this, I would like to hand over to PJ. PJ, thanks a lot for being here today. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Do you wanna share your screen? There we go, great. Uh, Stephanie, can you just confirm you can see that now clearly? Yes, yes we can great. see. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, and um, let me just start by thanking uh, Renewables Grid Initiative, firstly, for uh, putting their faith in me to conduct this review, which was actually very interesting and, and great fun to do. But also secondly, um, to provide this opportunity to share my findings with a broader audience today as well. So I think probably everybody um, on this call is well aware that offshore wind energy is a key tool in the global efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, since the early 1990s, Europe has very much led the way with this technology, and especially in the Baltic Sea and North Sea, where we've seen a lot of development of offshore wind farms uh, since the early 1990s. Of course, the irony is a technology that was developed specifically to improve sustainability does nonetheless have some environmental risks. Like any human structure that you deploy in the oceans and that you operate in the oceans, there are some environmental risks associated with that. Now, there is quite a lot of guidance out there in terms of how to mitigate those risks, and a lot of those are already being employed uh, in, in various wind farms. And this is just an example of guidance that came out earlier this year from some of my colleagues at IUCN and their partners looking at mitigating impacts uh, across the renewables energy sector. But what is proving more difficult for many actors is to actually know how best to get the data they need to make decisions on biodiversity in this sector. So let me be very specific about what I mean here. In order to choose and apply relevant mitigation measures, it's essential to identify and monitor potential environmental pressures and impacts, and then to monitor the marine fauna and flora affected. However, many actors are not always clear of the best monitoring methods to use, or if there are already data sets they can act uh, that could be of value to them as well. And so that's really basically sums up the reason uh, RGI asked me to do this work. Uh, the um, purpose of the exercise was to conduct a re review of in the offshore wind energy sector using the Baltic Sea and North Sea as case studies. And the aim then was to identify monitoring priorities and assess data collection methods and protocols in order that I could then make recommendations for a more standardized approach across the sector. And this is focusing on those two particular sea basins, but also with lessons that can be applied more broadly. Uh, just to be very clear on what I focused on, here I'm focusing on offshore wind energy infrastructure and the associated submarine power cables. 
What I'm not focusing on is the onshore infrastructure linked to that, such as sub substations and other onshore and offshore electricity generation sources. Okay, so in terms of process, um, earlier this year, I undertook a rapid narrative review of the literature, and I dug into both the peer-reviewed literature in, in, in scientific journals, but also I looked at the gray literature, reports, studies, uh, and also a range of different uh, regional strategies and policies. I also held informal interviews with a number of thematic experts to help uh, inform uh, my thinking on certain topics, and I participated in a very timely and useful bird life webinar uh, related to monitoring seabirds in this context. Now, when it came to assessing the different methods and priorities, I looked at a range of different criteria, and most of that was looking at the accuracy of the methods, reliability, feasibility, and appropriateness of what was uh, being used or being proposed, um, but also in particular, the value of the information generated for planning and decision-making. I did also look a bit at cost effectiveness, but as you will see when you get to read my report, that's actually quite a tricky thing to compare sometimes directly between methods. Okay, before I go into my findings, I just wanted to flag one key element of my approach here. Earlier this year, uh, I was involved in launching IUCN guidelines for planning and monitoring corporate biodiversity performance across sectors. So this is not just for the energy sector, it's for agriculture, extractives, pretty much every sector. Um, and this guidelines, we looked at what companies needed to consider in their interactions with biodiversity. And one key finding here relevant to my work for RGI was that monitoring needs to focus on indicators that are directly relevant to the goals and the biodiversity priorities that have been defined by assessing a company's environmental impacts. So it's not just a question of measuring biodiversity for the sake of it, but it has to be directly linked and applicable to the case in point. So keeping that in mind, what I did as part of the review was I identified the main pressures and impacts placed on biodiversity by offshore wind and its associated grids. I identified the main species and habitats affected, I looked at the relevant indicators, the ones that are being already proposed or the ones that would be most relevant. And then I dug deeper into the monitoring methods and protocols that are used and those that are most relevant across the sector. The report, as you'll see, is actually structured by taxa. So a lot of the work to date, and in fact, in some respects, it's, it's a challenge with the work to date. A lot of it is focused on specific taxa. A lot of work and, and so it was easier to review the material out there by uh, clustering my findings in the same way. So I looked at marine birds and bats together, in other words, um, flying species. Uh, I looked at marine mammals and then fish and seabed communities. What I'm going to do today um, is do my best to highlight my key findings and then also uh, flag my recommendations. It is a long report. Um, a lot of material is in annex. What I will try to do now is give you a flavor for that and then let you dig deeper um, afterwards. So what did I find? Okay, looking first then at the pressures and impacts. Now the pressures placed by offshore wind on biodiversity are generally fairly commonly agreed. And I'm not gonna list them all now in detail, but it's about habitat loss, uh, it's about collision mortality, if flying animals collide uh, with turbines, sometimes underwater organisms may collide with cables as well, or some of the supply vessels, uh, maintenance vessels. It's about displacing species due to disturbance from noise or other activity. And it's about the barrier effects that are caused by restricting the movement of species. And as you've seen from some of the photos at the start of this presentation, some of these wind farms now are very large indeed and do offer barriers to certain species moving. Most of the work to date, as I looked at this review, focuses a lot on the turbines, but submarine power cables also have impacts, including emissions of heat and electromagnetic fields. And work in recent years has broadened our understanding of that uh, to a, a large degree as well. So, it's worth pointing out at this stage that a number of positive impacts have also been noted for biodiversity around offshore wind farms. 
Um, there is an artificial reef effect that you get if you put solid structures uh, into the ocean. Any of you who are divers who've been around a wreck will see um, the concentrations of wildlife around those wrecks. And you get the same uh, around the submerged parts of uh, uh, offshore wind infrastructure as well. You also get a reserve effect because a lot of the wind farms and a lot of the areas uh, with large cables uh, basically restrict other activity, especially fishing. And so what you get, because there's less other human activity, you get animals especially drawn into those areas and causes a reserve effect. So in some cases, you actually get more fish or more birds in a wind farm uh, than you might expect. The pressures caused by uh, wind farms and, and grids on biodiversity, they vary. They vary, whoops. My presentation running away with itself. Okay, they vary by taxa. So for example, marine mammals tend to be more impacted by noise than birds are, but birds are more impacted by colliding with infrastructure than mammals are. Pressures also vary between the different stages of operation. Habitat loss usually occurs in construction when areas of seabed uh, are lost to the construction. Um, bird strikes obviously occur more during operation. Also, the design and type of technology used is very important as well. There's the difference between bottom fixed uh, turbines and floating turbines. And also with the associated grids, radial grids uh, tend to have less impact than meshed grids, or at least are expected to have less impact than meshed grids as well. One thing I'd point out at this stage though, and I think it's very relevant to keep in mind, is that generally offshore wind energy does have less of an impact on biodiversity and a whole range of other human activities, including fishing, oil and gas, and uh, shipping. Okay, now in terms of the tax are impacted, I mean, I've touched on some of it. There's a wide diversity of marine and coastal species and, and habitats affected. The biodiversity most at risk includes seals, tooth cetaceans, seabirds, bats, fish, and thick invertebrates, that's invertebrates that occur uh, on the seabed and in the seabed, as well as a range of plants and a variety of offshore and coastal habitat types. Existing monitoring efforts and indicators tend to focus quite heavily on marine mammals and birds, and they tend to focus more on turbines than submarine power cables, based on my review. And just as a, to give an indication there on the, the, the science is also slightly skewed like that. So if you look in Google Scholar, you will find twice as many scientific references relating to mammals and offshore wind energy than you will invertebrates and offshore wind energy. Now the indicators that people measure are diverse. They largely uh, revolve around the presence and abundance and diversity and distribution of species but sometimes as well, people are measuring the behavior of species, how they use the habitats, how they interact with the infrastructure. Um, and also some studies, some indicators are measuring breeding success of nearby colonies as well. The challenge though is the indicators used by different operators in, in different sea basins are not always clearly defined and they're not always the same. And that makes it very difficult to compare sites or compare what's going on in different seas. And it also blocks data aggregation. The other challenge is some of these indicators aren't monitored offshore. So to give you an example, so in terms of the two Cs that I was looking at, now the, the Helsinki Commission or HALCOM uh, is basically the, uh, the policy forum for environment for uh, the Baltic and the OSPAR Commission um, is the same uh, in the context of the Northeast Atlantic. And for these, sees there are already a set of regional indicators in place. Uh, they're largely measured at the national level, but some efforts are made to aggregate them regionally. But what you see, I mean, they have, both of them have bird abundance indicators, but unfortunately what tends to happen is those are usually focused on measuring coastal bird communities. And there is still much less data available on birds at sea. Okay, so if we look at the methods and protocols used to, to get data for these indicators, um, there are a whole range of different methods from observer-based surveys to the use of high-tech sensors. 
Um, one of the, perhaps the oldest methods, traditional methods is grab sampling. I mean, this really is, if you like, the most basic way of seeing what's in the ocean because you find out what's there by scooping up a sample of the seabed and seeing what you collect. Um, and that gives you an idea of the uh, organisms living there. Of course, this is often usually um, following uh, a survey with um, cameras dropped off the side of vessels as well. Also, uh, a lot of surveys are based on vessels, ship-based surveys, and are also uh, historically a lot of aerial surveys, uh, increasingly using digital technology to actually capture images and analyze uh, birds and mammals seen um, with digital technology. Passive acoustic monitoring is also being, uh, being used for a long time now. Uh, a lot of this involves um, recording the sounds generated, especially by marine mammals, but it can also be by other organisms as well. And these devices are usually deployed in buoys attached to the ocean floor and systematically collected to see which uh, species were detected. There are also increasing use of other technologies. I mean, baited remote underwater video uh, is a, a technique that we're seeing increasingly used and increasingly effective well, as well. Uh, they basically have a baited platform that brings in species and then the video records the diversity and, uh, of, of the species uh, that are found in that area. Okay, now in terms of how these methods have been applied, there is a whole suite of guidance and standards for applying these different methods uh, to oceans in general and to offshore wind in particular. And I've got some examples of there of relevant, relevant guidance documents. The challenge is though, if you look across these, they're not all very consistent. They're not always also <laughs> very easy to find. I'm still even now finding material that I didn't find in my initial review. And also there's, while there's a lot of, a lot of different methods, there's not always clear guidance on how you prioritize and how you choose between the different methods. So I explain that best in the report by having a deep dive into mammal monitoring. And if you look at the methods used for mammals, so what I did here, if you can see here, is I looked at three different national uh, sets of standards and guidance in Europe, and also then I looked at recommendations in the, for the Northeast Atlantic as a region. And what you'll see from that, there are several methods that every guidance or protocol recommends, especially digital aerial surveys, vessel-based surveys, and static acoustic monitoring. Uh, but then there are other methods that only one or two of the guidance documents suggest, such as toad arrays, uh, for acoustic monitoring or photo identification of mammals. So this is just a snapshot, and you'll see in the report, this is just a snapshot of the complexity at the moment. The guidance is out there, but it's not very consistent. And it's sometimes really hard to know, well, okay, in my situation, which of these would be most relevant to me? The other challenge with the existing guidance is threat monitoring guidance tends to focus very heavily on pile driving and the noise generated by pile driving and on bird collisions. Now, these are incredibly important, but there's not as much interest paid to pollution, such as oil spills, other sources of noise, and also invasive alien species. One of the other elements of my review was looking at existing regional strategies, and there are a whole suite of strategies, both at the sea basin level, but also the, the European Union level. And one thing, I lesson I drew from that exercise was that um, as we look at the offshore wind energy sector, we need to keep in mind as well um, the priorities that are identified for species and habitats in EU directives, in regional seas action plans. We also need to make sure that we're monitoring actions that are minimizing pressures. And we also need to make more effort to share data. And the EU strategy to harness the potential of offshore renewables, in particular, talks of mechanisms to share data. Now, Elaborating a bit more on that as an issue in my findings, I think many data collected around offshore wind energy sites and grids, such as that collected for environmental impact assessments, are just kept in reports, many of which are not shared or they're difficult to access. Data sharing is not systematic for marine biodiversity in general and for this sector in particular. There are efforts out there already and part of my recommendations here is that the knowledge sharing platforms and initiatives to standardize data that are already uh, started need to be looked at and built on and learned from as we develop systems, 
more widely. Okay, before I get into my recommendations, um, I just want to highlight two of the biggest challenges uh, with this review. Firstly, even though in 2021, we've had a lot of studies uh, into the impacts of offshore wind uh, energy, there is still inadequate information on the impacts on certain taxa and habitats, especially information on what the impacts on bats, marine turtles, benthic invertebrates is not as good as it should be. And also the extent and scale of some impacts, such as how much electromagnetic, electromagnetic fields affect fish is not as well known as it, as it could be. Also, some protocols are very dated. So I reviewed what was out there, but what you end up finding is many of the methods and protocols that are best developed and most widely applied, applied at the moment predate recent technological advances in remote sensing. On the flip side of that, many of the newer technologies, and this is an underwater glider used to deploy uh, an acoustic recording device, many of the newer methods are still in their infancy and protocols have yet to be developed or widely tested. So we're kind of caught in this, in, in this sort of period in time where some of the old methodologies are understood well, but are getting dated, but some of the newer ones are not yet fit for purpose for our needs. And that is a challenge in making recommendations here. Anyway, so let me quickly just summarize my main recommendations uh, from my study. First of all, I think it was clear from the outset, we need a more integrated, multi-species, multi-method approach to biodiversity monitoring in this sector. This needs to monitor the same things, and it needs to monitor them in the same way. We need to look at the same indicators that we can compare and scale up, and we need to try and use some of the same methods in a standardized way. And that then will facilitate data aggregation and sharing, and also allow us a better understanding of cumulative impacts. So the report structures the findings around five main recommendations. And the first one is just that point I raised about indicators. It's now standard best practice in the conservation world to use sets of common core indicators across sites to facilitate comparisons and data aggregation. And this is what you're also seeing at the national level for the Convention on Biological Diversity and for the Sustainable Development Goals. Key state indicators that clearly need to be measured consistently for offshore wind include area of occurrence, that's the distribution of species or the cover of a particular habitat type, and then the diversity and abundance of species, especially those priority species groups I mentioned before. In terms of threats that we need to target, um, bird and bat collisions with turbines need to be monitored as do anthropogenic noise levels. And we also need a bigger effort on invasive alien species. Now the second, um, well, using these harmonized approaches, um, what we then need to do is use the same methods. So, I mean, basically what I mean here is that if we have a small selection of methods that are applied consistently to measure the same indicators across sites, this could form a sort of set of minimum requirements that will help us harmonize our approaches and aggregate across region. So based on my review, I'd say at the moment, uh, across most of the sector, favored methods are digital aerial surveys, static passive acoustic monitoring, grab sampling, different forms of video and fight net sampling for fish. Now each of these has a specific advantage for a particular taxonomic group or a habitat type, but these are still generally the favored methods of collecting data. However, they do need to be complemented for specific issues and sometimes for reasons of feasibility by other methods too. And I think we will see uh, continuations of vessel-based surveys, code acoustic arrays, Sometimes telemetries, actually attaching uh, transmitters to different organisms to understand how they move and how they interact uh, with infrastructure. And also good old fashioned scuba diving, send somebody under the water to see for themselves what's going on is probably also a technique we will need in certain instances. And it's still one of the best methods for looking at invasive alien species on uh, vessel hulls. Also, as I mentioned, baited remote underwater video and acoustic mapping of habitats. 
Now, as I say, we're in a bit of a changing world. I think going forward, the more invasive methods will probably gradually phase out. Um, I think the idea that we're grabbing samples or boring for samples underwater or still fishing uh, to get samples is probably going to gradually become reduced. But I also think we're then going to see some of the more technological solutions, especially BRUVs, especially acoustic mapping, also become more standard. Okay, we also need to continue to explore ways of making sure that surveys are linked to each other. I did see in some cases incredible inefficiencies where clearly at some sites you'll get a boat going out one day to look for marine mammals, a boat going out another day to do grab sampling, a boat going out another day to do something else. I think we can look at ways of integrating surveys along the lines of what happens during the Euro European seabirds at sea surveys where mammal and bird data are collected at the same time. Uh, my third uh, recommendation, I'm sorry, it's quite hard to see the top of my screen with all of the Zoom um, content. Um, the third recommendation is about setting standard principles for monitoring. And this is really just making sure that we follow best practices in the sector for how you go about biodiversity monitoring. So this is choosing, this is about choosing the methods based on the indicator you're measuring, based on the question you're asking and then following established protocols. This is about making sure that monitoring is conducted at the right scope and scale. This is about making sure key stakeholders are engaged in the design and implementation of monitoring and to make sure that it, monitoring programs are fit for purpose. And also we need to, of course, make sure that data are collated in standard formats and shared. Now I'm conscious of time, but just briefly to touch on the scope and scale issue, um, most protocols suggest monitoring um, throughout the planning, construction, operation, and decommissioning phases with more intense monitoring at different parts of that, that cycle. And of course, there are exceptions. Uh, you don't tend to measure noise or collisions during the planning. <laughs> Excuse me. How often data are collected varies. Um, there's a lot of suggestion in national systems for monthly surveys. But in all honesty, talking to people and looking at what happens sending vessels or aircraft out every month in bad weather and high seas can be difficult. It may not get high quality data. It can even be dangerous. I think well-designed surveys conducted less frequently are probably better than just insisting on going out every month. Also, in terms of spatial scope, um, most guidance suggests including a buffer zone to the monitoring. But more guidance is needed on exactly what sort of buffer zone, what that entails, how big that should be, how far it should go. There's no consistency in that. And then also cumulative impact frameworks that are under development need to, uh, impact assessment frameworks need to be developed further as well. The fit for purpose bit, just to sort of uh, give a nod to the fact that however you go about monitoring, you do need to follow also the best design principles. And this is really just to reassure the real monitoring geeks on this call that I've also thought about the key issues that you might want to worry. So we need to follow best practices for ensuring robust sampling design and statistical power. So that would include uh, appropriate and consistent sampling methods, ensuring we conduct power analysis to determine how much data is sufficient, and also correcting for observer bias and availability bias. The other key issue, which is happening more and more in biodiversity conservation projects as well, is making sure that the design includes the measure of counterfactuals to demonstrate or infer cause and effect. And the most common one in this context is the before and after control impact design and the before after gradient design. Now, basically what this means, this is an example taken out of a recent paper. What that means is monitoring shouldn't just occur at the wind farm site, it should also occur at a similar site or in the ocean a little bit further away so that you actually get a comparison. And what this particular example here shows is data in gray collected at a, a control site, in this case, one that was unprotected, and the data in green show what happened at a site that uh, underwent protection. And the dotted line is the moment of the intervention. And so basically what you're looking at there is the comparison, what changed in the control sites and the intervention site. And from that, you can start to infer something about how your intervention affected biodiversity. And that is something uh, that increasingly needs to be adopted and indeed is standard, uh, 
standard recommendation in many national guidelines. Also, I won't go to this detail now, but like I said, some of our knowledge gaps need to be filled. We need more knowledge on some of the impacts on bats and turtles and some of these uh, the impacts of electromagnetic fields and pollution. And we also need to continue to explore the use of new technologies. And I haven't discussed environmental DNA yet, but DNA metabarcoding is also starting to be used quite successfully in ocean environments and could also become a useful tool in the future for identifying uh, the species that occur in the area. Last but really not least, uh, and then again, this is directly relevant to the IUCN guidelines I mentioned at, at the beginning. It is absolutely essential that people collaborate in the development and uh, implementation of monitoring schemes. There's a huge lot of work already going on out there, a huge lot of monitoring going on, but a greater level of sectoral and regional collaboration needs to happen in the future that happens now. Key stakeholders need to be engaged as we decide the best way forward. This is obviously companies, governments, intergovernment agencies and regional bodies, academia and civil society. There are already a number of regional initiatives or fora that exist for such discussions. And I name some examples, the Offshore Coalition for Energy and Nature. There are also some regional working groups on seabirds and marine mammals. And these are just examples of the sorts of fora that perhaps should be explored more and should be engaged in helping come up with standards across the sector. I also think lessons could be learned from other Europe-wide monitoring schemes, especially those on, say, contaminants and radioactivity. And also we need to look a bit beyond Europe as well. A lot of the latest innovation in marine monitoring is coming from Australia. And of course, the US uh, and North America in general is, is now uh, getting more into offshore renewables as well. So that, in a nutshell, is um, what I found in my report. And I hope I gave you a, a flavor for those findings. I think in closing, I'd just like to underline my last point about collaboration. So I was brought in as a scientist and as a monitoring specialist to review the state of play at the moment and to make some recommendations. But it's not for me to now decide how to take this forward. As I say, it's very much for the actors in the sector to sit down and together decide how best do we standardize our approaches. Now, those actors may decide that they don't want to follow the indicators precisely as I suggest, they might want to favor other methods than the ones I did. But again, based on my experiences, from this review and from other sectors. What I can say though, it is absolutely essential that across the sector, we agree on at least a small number of indicators that are measured everywhere, that we agree on how we're gonna harmonize the methods to collect data against those indicators, and that we agree on the best way of sharing data among ourselves and with global databases. Now, I know that's gonna be a challenge. It's gonna take a lot of dialogue. It will decide who needs to lead on certain aspects of that. But I honestly think if we can get more agreement on those approaches, it will enhance resource-based management, it will enhance data-driven deci data decision-making, and that's ultimately going to help us re reduce the environmental impacts of offshore wind and grids on biodiversity. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks a lot, PJ. Um, incredibly interesting presentation. Uh, thanks a lot for joining today and for uh, presenting everything that you've researched in the beginning of this year. Um, we're very happy to have all this information at hand now. Um, and I hope that the speakers that we have invited to um, share their direct reaction um, feel the same, but let's see. Um, I would like to ask uh, Viviane de Grey, Marine Environment Officer at RTE first. Um, Viviane, what do you make of PJ study. Um, do you think the recommendations are helpful for your daily work as someone who's directly involved in um, offshore planning and offshore renewable energy implementation? Um, and do you have open questions or concerns considering what you've just heard? Are you ready to share your thoughts? Vivian, are you here? Okay, 
at least I don't hear her. So um, I would just jump to uh, the next person that we have. Ah, now I hear someone. Vivian? Yes, very quietly. So if you could turn your volume up a bit. Turn now? Yes. Ah, perfect. Yes. Ah, amazing. Uh, thank you. So thank you very much for the presentation. It was uh, very uh, interesting. And uh, we are at uh, RTS, so the French TSO quite uh, totally in line uh, with the recommendations of uh, PJ uh, Stephenson. So um, to add uh, some inputs uh, from what we do in, uh, in France uh, as, a, as a TSO, uh, first uh, on data. Um, the TSO is responsible for gathering all the environmental data uh, needed for impact assessment uh, related to marine uh, power grid. And uh, as it was uh, presented uh, before, uh, data on uh, benthic communities and on fish are the main focus for a submarine um, cable. So we, are, we totally agree with that. And we have the problem as well that the data is not centralized, it's not harmonized. And it comes from several sources like uh, public or private or um, NGOs. And also from our own in study, um, our own uh, in situ uh, studies. So um, we set uh, recently an uh, internal uh, geo database uh, to, um, to be able uh, to, to share with other French uh, stakeholders uh, the data that we gather uh, for our projects. So I think it could be interesting, interesting to, to share uh, with other uh, international <laughs> stakeholders uh, the geo database that we carried out, for example, could be a, an idea. And on uh, monitoring and, and protocols, um, we rely uh, on national recommendations uh, set out in application of uh, European directives on the marine environment and of course on OSPAR uh, recommendation as well. And uh, so we are uh, totally in line with the um, relevance of uh, sharing common indicators and monitoring methods and protocols. And we also would be happy to share the protocols uh, that we carry um, out for our environmental uh, impact assessments and for our monitoring programs. Um, however, it is, I think, important to underline that uh, protocols are discussed with authorities and local uh, and French <laughs> authorities and scientific experts and local stakeholders, uh, such as uh, fishermen, for example, and environmental NGOs. So um, our protocols and um, our monitoring uh, programs may vary a lot uh, depending on uh, the stakeholders uh, we are discussing with. So this is something maybe we, we, we should take into account uh, why we share uh, with other TSOs. Maybe we can, we can share uh, on a, a basis like a, low, like a, a classic, <laughs> I could say, protocols and monitoring methods but there is always uh, an adaptation uh, linked to the context, I think. And um, maybe on the fourth uh, recommendation, which is to conduct a research to improve monitoring uh, programs, uh, we are totally in line uh, as well. And uh, we take part uh, at RTE in various uh, research projects. Uh, for example, we, we try to use um, an innovative uh, monitoring tools, uh, which is uh, the Great Scallop, uh, Dr. Maximus. And we also have uh, several, uh, several um, research and development programs on uh, electromagnetic fields, EMF, uh, as uh, it was uh, set out um, by uh, big issues for Vivian, your for connection seems to be getting a lot weaker. Projects. So we have a several uh, research and development programs um, studying the impact of EMF. 
Ah, okay. But um, I'm also finished. Could you hear me well now? Better? Um, we could hear you again in the end. There seems to be Is that better. <laughs> there seems to be quite a bit of delay between uh, what I'm saying and when you're mm -hmm. hearing it. But yes, we could hear you better in the end. Is there? Um, uh, okay. <laughs> it, it it did bit. Ah, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> No worries. Um, is there still a point okay. you can make? So I, I was just saying that we, we could be happy as well to share. Uh, we, we started recently to share on the, our research and development programs on the MF. Yes. Yes, it's, um, it's, all, uh, it's, all, uh, it's all okay for me. So if you have uh, any further questions, uh please uh, tell me and uh as i said uh, we 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 would be happy to to follow um so several uh, subjects great thanks a lot vivian and uh, very good to hear that um you find the report helpful and uh the way forward that is recommended seems to be in line what your needs are as well um PJ, is there a direct reaction from your side to what Vivian has shared, or do we want to move on to the next stakeholder? Right. Reaction? I've done a lot of talking, so I would move on. But just to say that, thank you for that feedback, um, and it was yeah, very very encouraging to hear. Great. Um, then I would like to ask Antonio Volcano, Marine Officer for Europe and Central Asia at BirdLife International, to take the stage. Um, and to share with us what, um, as a stakeholder, also directly affected in your work by the recommendations that come from this report, um, what do you make of it? Um, and do you have any questions that you would like to discuss in this regard? Hello, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, thanks for giving me the floor. And thanks, PJ, for the excellent uh, report. Um, I think as well that uh, as expressed as already from our colleague from the PSO uh, as uh, NGOs, we, we do agree that uh, uh, we want to push for more data sharing. That's obviously very good. Um, and, um, and also for having more uh, harmonized uh, protocols. Although I also agree that uh, it's important uh, to keep um, in mind and consider all the different uh, regional or national uh, contests. Uh, we have done already some uh, preliminary work as well. Uh, I know PJ is aware and uh, the, all the coalition as well on um, data sources and high-risk species, uh, seabirds high-risk species, um, uh, regarding the interactions between seabirds and uh, um, energy developments in the North and in the Baltic seas. And uh, so overall, I think the, the recommendation, they, they also reflect uh, what, what our report uh, says. Uh, I just would like to stress out on the importance of focusing on um, the data that are already there, because I think like otherwise uh, there is the risk that we never advance uh, on, uh, on assessing um, uh, the, the potential threat uh, that uh, that uh, energy development goes to marine fauna. So we already have good data there. Obviously, we want more data. So we are in favor of collecting, having more research and collecting more data for more species in particular, because we don't know a lot of um, uh, behavioral uh, patterns linked with, with interaction with off offshore wind farms. Uh, but the data that are there, they might be already good to guide the testing of mitigation measures or best practices, for example, uh, such as turning off the blades during the immigration time, for example, for, for birds, uh, to avoid the interactions. And um, obviously, as you mentioned, renewable energy, they're going to be one of the largest global infrastructures and dangers um, that are ever attempt in our era, basically, uh, with a lot uh, occurring um, uh, offshore. And uh, yeah, we would just to stress, we would just like, sorry, to stress that uh, uh, it's not really acceptable to say um, um, that there is not, there is too little data, uh, 
plan this uh, infrastructure in a bird safe uh, manner. This is obviously just an overall statement, not just related to necessarily to the, um, to the, um, to the report, but we, we wanted to stress this here. We could, it, it's important. We just mind, we just find, uh, we just, sorry, must find a way to utilize the data that we have to push uh, this development lower risk areas, for example, or again, to have like uh, mitigation measures and best uh, practices in, uh, in place. And um, so, yeah, and uh, we, we, we will be helpful actually to uh, our team, the energy team is working a lot uh, on sensitivity mapping in, uh, in other areas of the world, in, in Asia, for example, in the economics exclusive zones, trying to find um, some of robust approaches that work in, in low data regions. And we, we thought that this could be actually helpful uh, for other regions as well. So I just wanted to highlight uh, this here. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. And uh, very good to hear that uh, you also agree that this is a useful report and also good to hear um, an additional perspective on what else is important. Um, PJ, what do you think about um, what Antonio has just said in terms of it's important to also focus on the data that's already there and, um, well, get moving? Um, what are the risks there as compared to um, focusing on, um, yeah, finding more data, getting more data ready that um, everyone can use and that's more harmonized? Um, my assumption would be we just need to go full steam ahead on both. Well, it, it's it's another of the reasons for trying to get better at data sharing um, instead of keeping the data in certain projects or with certain organizations uh, or not having any sort of sharing across um, regions. Um, because the more the more we share, the more, as you point out, Antonio, the more we can use existing data to give an idea already, especially in the planning phase, of course, because that's where existing data is key to understand where the migration corridors are, to understand the distribution of the more threatened species that are of interest um, uh, at national and regional level. So that's where it's really key. So that's why it's more important that if an environmental impact assessment is conducted for a particular installation or a particular wind farm, that if then that's shared, then people will know in future that, okay, in that part of the ocean, then you know, we have these records of these species and this happened. I think that where we just have to be careful is at the end of the day, while there is a lot of data out there, there are a lot of data out there, you can do a certain amount of modeling. At the end of the day though, on specific sites, you, do, you will need, still need some uh, data collection at that site to just make sure um, things are, are going well. The other point I should just add, which also builds a bit on Viviane's point actually about research. The other way, of course, because what of course scares people, not just in the offshore wind sector, but in all sectors is that, oh my word, we've got to monitor all of this biodiversity, this is scary. Um, <laughs> and so the point is, and that's my point about focusing in, focusing on a subset of the species, focusing on certain uh, indicators uh, involved in that as well. But if, we also continue the research. And if, for example, we can start excluding certain threats, I mean, to be fair, some of what I've seen recently on electromagnetic fields suggest that they may not, I'm not gonna make any major claim, but they may not be having a significant impact on biodiversity. If we can decide that is not, uh, if research shows that is not a worry, then we don't have to monitor it. Um, the other issue, of course, is if we study well and we get good examples and share case studies, if people have shown that certain mitigation measures, and it might be shut down on demand for turbines, it might be all the different tools that can be used to reduce the impact of a pile driving noise on, on cetaceans. If we can show that those interventions have worked, then we can start drawing conclusions from people's activities. And we won't necessarily have to measure the impact at every site. We can draw some conclusions. We've seen, okay, 90% of sites before that mitigation measure was, was applied, then if we can just guarantee we've applied it, we may not need quite so much biodiversity data. Now, I'm not letting people off the hook and saying, I don't need to collect any data, but I'm just saying there are ways we can try and make it a bit more manageable. Great, uh, thanks a lot. 
Um, I would move on to our third stakeholder reaction and would like to hear from Tina Tambendixen, who is the lead environment and permitting specialist at Ørsted, um, obviously also directly um, affected by the recommendations made by the report. Um, Tina, what do you think about what you've read and heard and yeah. uh, what is your reaction? Yeah, I think uh, it's not new to me, of course, <laughs> because that is what we work with. I mean, as we have been in the uh, dealing with also wind farms for 30 years in, in, and we are in many different countries. So the thing about all these different methods and, and different regulations and are not new to us, unfortunately. <laughs> so I, I've, I can totally agree that we should have some more standardized way of doing this. And I think exactly for the planning is really important. And when we talk biodiversity, that when we have a good planning, we can also uh, de-risk actually our projects because then we, we can place the projects in the best places maybe. So, um, so I don't disagree about that. Um, what I'm thinking a little bit about, uh, I do not I agree totally with the things said before. And, and if, if I take this uh, old data, new data discussion, uh, we have actually started at Ørsted trying to make a database for all our data, because it's not that we just collect all the data we have from all projects in one place. Often we buy a project and we don't even have the old data from, from that project. They are just, for example, in UK where we have many projects, they are delivered to, to the authorities in a database and, and we don't know where they are. Or maybe we didn't even get them when we bought the project. So it can be very difficult for us actually to find these old data. Uh, so I think it's, it's for us it would be more about looking at the new data and maybe do that in a kind of standardized way that we could share across countries also. Uh, that could really help the planning. Um, what I'm always thinking is where is the um, responsibility for all the EIA surveys? Uh, it depends on the countries we are in. And I, I think it could also be an approach that you take it up to a national level and do a lot of the in investigations at a national level. Uh, we also see that in many countries. Uh, then you don't have uh, different projects owning the data. It's just in a common database. And that would also help the authorities before their planning. And what we normally do in the projects is then we, we, we just do the monitoring uh, that is, it has come out uh, from this um, in environmental impact assessment, then they say, okay, then you have to measure for that or this, or it's actually not us choosing exactly what we are going to investigate in an area. We sometimes do that, come with a proposal, but, um, but often we just follow some recommendation in that specific country. Um, so, I don't know. I, th I think we could we could also be in working groups. We we are not the the specialists in in environment. We are not the specialists in ecosystems. Maybe we can come with some technical solutions for the design or something like that. But but I think the main uh, planning or uh, for this should be at a national level. And that is why I think it's really good that we have this ocean group where we talk with each other and we come with recommendations that we can drive forward to national level maybe and, and could also participate in a stakeholder engagement group there. But, but I think it's really important that the decision makers are on top of this. So, so it comes to a higher level. Um, I also had a comment about this, uh, this keep collecting data. I also think, but, but you also mentioned that now, uh, at a certain level, we might have enough data and we might have learned enough from the data we have. Um, so now we, it, it might not be necessary to, to just keep collecting the data year after year after year. Um, but I think it could be really interesting to get some reflection on that part. Who is actually responsible for doing this? We have all these recommendations now, but, but how do we move on with that? How do, how do we get them to a level so we can do this standard uh, way of doing things? 
Thanks a lot. Yeah, I think that's the that's the critical question. Um, yeah. How do we how do we get to a point um, where everyone actually has the data that they need in order to do things in a timely manner and an environmentally friendly manner in a way that all stakeholders involved feel like they're satisfied with the data that uh, the operation, the implementation of something new is based on. Um, I think we would all be very happy if we found an answer to this today. I don't expect us to. Um, PJ, do you have a reaction to this still? And is there maybe, because you mentioned a couple of databases that exist already. Um, Tina, you mentioned that you have a database where you collect things. Is there is there a place already where um, a good start has been made and where it would be good to add to something where you see um, a, a promising start? Okay, so in, in the report, which of course I appreciate most people hearing us now won't have read yet, but in the report I do flag a number of regional and global databases that are available. And I think, I mean, the point, well, I'm very reassured to hear again there that there are efforts to create databases so even certain companies or actors are, are collecting their own data. And that's, I mean, that's a big challenge. Even, you know, I'll be frank, even certain conservation organizations are not that strong on collecting and managing their data or sharing it. It is a bit of a, 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 a broader problem. There are all sorts of reasons for that, but it's encouraging. I think the starting point is at least people collating data. I think then uh, usually the issue of sharing is not so much a technical one, but a political one. Uh, there are all sorts of reasons, and I, I totally understand, and this is uh, in all sectors, uh, in all business sectors, this is an issue, um, but to be fair also in, 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 the, in, in the civil society sector as well, um, there are sometimes issues, people are, get nervous sometimes at sharing data and what it might say about them, but at the end of the day, we have to get to a situation where everybody's a bit more open about that, and I think, so the starting point is obviously the actors that already have a lot of data can start compiling it. But then I think this does need to, I mean, this needs to be a group discussion. The key actors need to decide for themselves. You know, the European Union's already trying to get some data at a Europe-wide level. There's obviously some efforts made in the sea basins. Where, I mean, where do people want to put the data? What makes sense? And how does it then feed from those regional databases into the global ones? Um, just to point out, by the way, that the European ones, um, that uh, data collected, like for example, in the IMOD nets, uh, that you see that does then link up with global databases. There's a global marine database, there's a global also broader biodiversity database, GBIF, uh, which also keeps records of the presence of species in different places over time. And I think the challenge, I mean, there are all these different levels. You've got a particular sites, you might have you know, a particular turbine or a wind farm, and then you go all the way up to the global level. We do have to find ways that the data are shared partly then so it can feed in and it can help others who come along to learn lessons as well. Um, but I'm aware that there are, I don't underestimate the challenges of making that happen because I'm aware that there are, you know, a lot, a lot of people are quite nervous about that. Hmm. We do have a question in the chat that is actually directly related to this from Joanna, who um, is part of Emotnet, as I understand from, uh, from her username here. Joanna, do you want to ask your question directly to PJ? Yes, hi, good afternoon. Yes, I, I am the coordinator for Imonet Biology. And uh, yeah, we do find that there is a bit of reluctance in sharing data for certain sectors of activity, this being one of them. And my question to everyone, not, not, just, not just PJ, is uh, how can we better support the sector to share their data and um, yeah, what information do you think the potential data providers are missing um, to, to share the data? Do, do, do you think they know of the existence of these infrastructures? If, if anyone knows, <laughs> thanks. Well, all I would say, I'll, I'll let others answers too, but all I can say from, from my review and looking at, I think there is still, it's not always commonly known. I think, as you say, there's reluctance on one hand for it, what can be a variety of reasons. Um, but sometimes it is a lack of understanding. I know you guys have made a big effort to get the word out there. Uh, again, of course, this is also um, using ImodNet is also uh, a, a recommendation directly stemming um, from uh, an EU strategy as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, Europe wide, this would be a great mechanism. And of course, what these guys have done also is they adopt standard 
means of collecting data. So I'm not just talking here about, um, uh, you know, whether you use a grab sample or whether you use um, acoustic monitoring. I'm talking about then how the data are actually um, compiled um, and labeled, uh, which is also very key for this data sharing. And uh, again, networks like Imodnet um, uh, have guidance on that, as indeed do GBIF at the global level. So I think some way of plugging this sector more into some of those regional and global efforts would be would be really good. Thanks a lot. Um, Joanna, is that um, a helpful answer already? And because you addressed your question, not just to PJ, but to everyone in the room here, is there someone else who would like to react and give an additional answer? You can just, um, if you do have a reaction to this, raise your hand and uh, I'll call on you, or you can just start talking because don't think we're in danger of too many people talking over each other. Um, and if not, um, please do share additional questions that you may have um, in the same manner. We already have a question posted in the chat by, um, Oh, it's uh, Ode, Ode, Lawrence from RTE. Um, do you want to ask the question that you have? Yes, Ode, uh, Lawrence, thank you. Um, yes, I have a question regarding the data collection. And uh, I was wondering, uh, from what you've seen uh, while performing this study, do you have a, an opinion on what would be the most efficient way to collect data? Um, should it be collected on a case-by-case -case basis by in industrial or project owner with an obligation to use a standardized method and share the collected data? That's the way it's done in France or I think many countries, or should it be uh, uh, organized at a more centralized and national level, maybe by the government and public institutes um, and with a system that you know, if you need, would need some data, you would have to contribute and to finance this type of uh, uh, way to collect data. Do you have a, maybe, um, I, I don't know if uh, that's how it works in some European countries or not. I think you, you hit the nail on the head with the issue, which is that there's a lot of national variability at the moment. I think that there obviously, there's a certain amount of variability in legislation, although at least in the EU, there's some standardization there. But then in terms of um, even the contracting, the whole process um, uh, for consenting, um, then the people that then go about doing the surveys, I mean, there is a certain amount of variability in that between countries, um, just as there are in methods. I mean, I point out in my report too, uh, certain countries uh, are standardizing now digital aerial surveys, but others still are more comfortable standardizing vessel-based surveys. Now, um, how that data then are collected, who, who the emphasis falls on is a little bit difficult for me to say. All I would say though, is as I said, if the sector, the different actors uh, could talk a bit more about what they would find most useful and get to study a little bit the options that are available, uh, in my report, I mentioned eight different regional databases and even more global databases with marine data that could be of potential use too. Um, we also need to perhaps share some case studies of where people have used data or fed data into that and they've uh, to, to share their experiences. Uh, because I think what might be one of the bigger issues now is more a bit of an awareness campaign of what the options are um, and also some case studies showing you know, how that works in reality and how people have benefited from that. I'm not sure I answered your question directly, but it was more on the general subject. All right, thanks a lot, PJ. Um, you mentioned in your presentation earlier that um, you know that there are also organizations who are a little bit reluctant when it comes to sharing data, just because they think, oh, if we if we're sharing something that we may have done wrong or there's um, a strong impact on something maybe that reflects badly on us. Um, do you think there are, are actually any risks involved in this data sharing exercise? And um, if so, how can we get rid of this, these risks or reassure um, the organizations involved that actually um, this is meant as an exercise to collaboratively get better at this? 
Well, I, I did an exercise a few years ago with, with uh, colleagues from a range of different organizations. And we actually, that stage, um, uh, were looking not in Europe, but in another region of the world. But we use that as a starting point to look at the factors affecting data availability. And in fact, I'm literally next month just about to start uh, a brand new research project at the University of Lausanne where we're going to look a bit more at the factors that affect data availability for biodiversity for different actors. And the, the point is that is a topic that still needs studying is the reason I mentioned that. Um, because in the, the, the work we've done to date, we've identified one of the blockages is willingness to share data. And one of the blockages, uh, one of the causes for that is again, this, this nervousness about how people will uh, treat that. Now this willingness to share data that also extends into the conservation sector. I know some conservation NGOs that are also quite nervous, uh, won't necessarily broadcast their latest program evaluation for similar reasons. The challenge and what I've stated in some of my publications is that we actually need to try and change the culture of it. We actually need to more of a results-based management culture where there's that the, it's safe to fail. I mean, people talk about this, having the safe to fail. Now, people are nervous about that, and, and I understand that, but we need a culture where people have to actually be respective of the fact they've gone out there and they've collected the data to see what's going on. And we have to admit, sometimes the data will not show a picture that any of us want, but it's reality. There will be a reason for that. I would much rather see and I've talked to some donor agencies about this too, when they get fed up, I've heard certain donors that tell me they're very fed up with happy reporting from conservation projects. Everybody wants to say everything's going really well. A lot of them like me would much rather see a culture where we actually say, you know what, we put in place a really good monitoring and evaluation framework and learning framework. We basically take the data, we apply adaptive management, and that means if things are going well, you replicate what's going well, but if things aren't going so well, you, you investigate a bit more why that might be, and then you adapt. And that is the essence of adaptive management, data-driven management and decision-making. And that should be rewarded, not punished. But of course, what people are worried about, oh my word, the birds have declined in our area. Um, if we publish that, everybody think we've you know, destroyed the environment. We have to get to a situation where it's okay, but what are you doing about that now? Uh, you know, Are you implementing shutdown on demands? Um, systems that might actually mitigate this problem. I mean, it's about responding, but it is, it's a cultural issue. And as we all know, changing culture takes a lot longer. So there's no silver bullet, no easy solution for this. Um, but it is something I think needs to be talked about more openly. Yeah, I fully agree with you. We've actually um, engaged in a best practice exchange beyond Europe in the past. And uh, we've seen that, uh, especially when we talk to colleagues from America, that they're much more open when it comes to approaches like this and that there's, they feel much safer in failing and actually sharing learnings that they've, um, that they've taken from things that might not have worked and applying that to getting better in the future. So yeah, I fully agree that we, um, that's definitely a thing that we should learn to be more comfortable with. Tina, do you have a direct reaction to this? Yeah, I just I just have a small comment for that. That for us, in a certain period of the development of the project, there might be some competition, uh, meaning that we will not share our da data during that period. Um, so, so that could also be the case sometimes. Mm. Mm. Is there anyone else here in the group that has a reaction to this and that maybe would like to? to share why for them in the past, it has been difficult um, to easily share data. Um, we have another reaction in the room, Antonella Battalini, the CEO of RGI. Um, do you wanna contribute? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, so um, I think that uh, sharing data, as uh, PJ said, is a mindset. It's a, it's a completely different way of looking. And I understand that there is uh, um, competing uh, um, concerns, especially from the side of the industry. But if we are really looking at the amount of offshore wind that, is, that we need to deploy, then maybe competition on this data, it's not the key problem that we have. Uh, 
and I really would like to see uh, in the data working group some progress be made in the offshore coalition to find solutions on how to systematically collect and, and share data. And you can also, with Emonet, it's clear that you can give your data after uh, Tina, the, the that phase where you are concerned about competition. So, but it is, I think we need a commitment from everybody that after a set number of months, this data is made available. But of course, it has to be collected in the in a common way. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for adding to this. Um, we have another reaction to this in the chat from Chelsea Bradbury. Chelsea, do you want to share your reaction directly and say a bit about how you share data? Yeah, hi Stephanie, thank you. Um, just reflecting on the comments and, and what Tina was talking about there, I guess, in the UK, well, in England, Wales and, and Northern Ireland, um, the Crown Estate require the offshore wind developers to provide their survey data to the Marine Data Exchange. Um, and then we then work with the developers um, to publish that data within a, a reasonable time frame. And I think that point that Tina made is, is really important about understanding the need to, to balance kind of when the data is published with the commercial requirements of the wind farm and the remit because from the crown estates point of view the last thing we want to do is publish any data that could then have an impact on the success of that wind farm going forward and, and jeopardize the potential to have that green energy there supporting the uk requirements so i think it's about working with the industry to really understand and continuously adapt as the industry evolves to those sensitivities and those risks to sharing survey data but also make sure that those approaches are adopted by all of the offshore wind farm developers within the uk for example not just orsted so we work with all of the customer base to make sure that they've all got the same consistent standards for data delivery, but also the same requirements in terms of publishing and sharing data. So it's just one model. And I mean, we do work with a ModNet and we're looking at how we can get that data into a ModNet a little bit more to help with this. It's, it's We don't have all of the answers yet. So I'm very keen on this discussion and, and learning more from everybody here, but it's just one of the examples that we do have at the moment. Thanks for um, sharing this. I'm pleased, if I may, uh, Stephanie, just to say I'm very pleased, Chelsea, thank you for that intervention, but I'm very pleased to say that in my discussion in the report of national databases, I do uh, mention the Marine Data Exchange of the Crown Estate in particular as, a, as an example of that, because uh, as I looked around to see what was available, that did stand out. Oh, that's great. Thanks, PJ. Yeah, I was going to say thanks a lot for sharing this great example, and maybe can you add a little bit and say, did you have in setting this up, um, did you have similar concerns from um, the stakeholders that you work with in terms of sharing their data? How hard was it to, um, to push this through? Yeah, so we have a, a data clause. So the Crown Estate essentially manage or play a role in managing the seabed around England, Wales and Northern Ireland. So we grant the leases for the activity on the seabed. Um, and in those leases, we've put a data clause um, back in 2003. So essentially very early on in the offshore wind journey within the UK. Um, the Marine Data Exchange didn't come about until 2013, but we really used that time from 2003 to 2013, so a long time. This is definitely not a quick solution um, to work with our customers, to work with the offshore wind sector, to really understand how can data help them to de-risk the sector as a whole? Um, and, and how can we make sure that all of that data isn't held individually by different projects? Tina raised an exceptional point earlier about the fact that very early on projects were being handed over to different developers. So how could we really make sure that that data wasn't lost, but that it was safeguarded in, in one place? Mm -hmm. um, so for example, when Orsted came on and, and took on a different project, we were able to then share the data that the previous developer had collected on the site. Um, but I think it has been about evolving and continuously adapting our processes. So at the very start of the offshore wind journey, wind data resource, 
acceptedly was the the one sensitive data set whereas now geotechnical data is a lot more sensitive and then going forward environmental data is now playing a huge part in in the process in the sustainable development of the seabed it's less of a tick box to say that that work and that environmental monitoring has been carried out and now it seems to be a, a really integral part of the whole um, design process so I think it's just about how we continue to work with the sector because ultimately they want to make sure that the huge amounts of work that they are doing the huge amounts of money that they're spending on collecting this amazing data is actually being used to benefit the sector so it's feeding back into those feedback loops and it's helping to deliver more proportionate environmental impact assessments and make sure that they are collecting the relevant data rather than just collecting data for the sake of it. Yeah, definitely. Thanks a lot for sharing this. And it sounds like uh, we have a lot of catching up to do. Um, we are, for this webinar, almost out of time. So if someone has um, a burning question, please get it in now. Um, and if someone has um, some experience to share with the group, um, that would be also really helpful to hear from you. So please raise your hand if you have something to add. Doesn't look like people are too keen to join in the conversation. Ah, great, Roland. Um, Roland is a colleague of mine. Do you wanna ask a question? Yes, thank you, Steffi. Uh... Thanks a lot, PJ, for the very informative uh, presentation. I'd like to ask a question related to your, um, to you proposing or the report proposing basically to adopt a set of key monitoring principles and to have an integrated approach. Should this, these principles, or at least some of them, be mandatory or should, can they be optional? for monitoring around the uh, offshore wind uh, energy development, or how do you go about it? I hope my, this is clear, thanks. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's tricky that, isn't it? So it's carrot or stick. Do you try and make it um, obligatory or do you try and make it attractive to do it? And I think that goes back to the culture if people start to see actually, you know what, if we're collecting this and making it available, we you know don't, it, it's it's encouraged and, and we show we're leaders almost in the, in the field so i think it is partly that it would be good i think the basic principles again it has to be decided at what level so you've got a lot of effort already in Halcom and ospar to look at their their indicators and, and work with those that's obviously across the whole sea basins then uh, within the sectors we just heard there are some initiatives at national level the challenge at the moment is all very disjointed there's a lot going on so it's it it, it it would really be good if there was some uh, effort made to try and say, okay, if we need to adopt, if we're ever going to get to stage, we can share data in a meaningful way that people can use. We do need to adopt at least some practices, some core indicators, some ways of 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 doing business, and 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 you know, to what extent can we all agree on that? I think as much we can get voluntary, the better. Um, but I think the other thing that perhaps should encourage people more in in, in this field. I mean, it's. It, my perception, at least, is that people want offshore wind energy to work. I mean, let's face it, and it's everybody's best interest. It's renewables. It's what the world is about at the moment. And finally, having been involved in environmental work for more years than I'd care to admit, finally, climate change is really up there at, on the agenda. Finally, biodiversity is starting to get on the agenda as well. So people can finally are starting to see it's, it's, it's getting on political agendas, so now is the time and people really want renewable energy to work. So I think if people see it in that light, it's like, okay, so we are going to make mistakes, but you know, let's share data so we can avoid putting something in the middle of a migration path, or we can find better mitigation measures to reduce our impact. I mean, it's all about trying to do better for the environment on all fronts. I couldn't agree more. I think um, that's almost a good closing statement already. Um, but before I let you go, um, I do want to ask if you have um, an additional um, statement that you want to leave everyone with. Um, and maybe if you could um, give everyone here, because there are so many people here um, involved um, in their daily work in the topic that we're talking about. 
um, and so many people here who could hopefully help us do something about the problem. And it seems that everyone here more or less seems to agree um, on the way forward that we need to take, but everyone is a bit stumped on um, the specific next step or how to really make a difference. Um, so if you could leave everyone here with a little piece of homework, what would you say? What are, what are the next steps that people could take if they wanted to do something actively? Well, I think I underlined it several times. It's about now carrying on a dialogue. And as I said, I don't think it's really for me to say you should use this form or not. I think you guys at RGI are obviously uh, facilitating a dialogue here. There are a whole range of different actors that, that should continue to play that role. So I think it needs to be a discussion. Like I said, I don't think people need to agree on the best way forward. What I would leave you with perhaps more is, is just lessons, as I've said, in developing those IUCN guidelines in the last few years, working across sectors, including actually the marine services sector, but also a range of other sectors. The one thing that I would just say is people should not freak out about biodiversity because at the moment companies in every sector are still a bit daunted by biodiversity. I always say biodiversity is what? Bacteria to blue whales and everything in between. And that kind of freaks people out. Okay, well, how are we gonna make sure we don't impact all of these species and all of their habitats? What do we do here? I think what we've shown and again, I think that's reinforced by this study is you just need to almost like stay calm, but like think through, unpack, what does biodiversity mean for this sector? So like I say, always go back. It shouldn't be about, somebody just mentioned ticking boxes because it has to be done. And I appreciate there's movement away from that now, but that's historically, I mean, I've been to um, other power plants in the world that aren't renewables and monitoring really is just a, a box ticking exercise. People don't even know half the time why they're counting the birds down the coast. Um, <coughs> we, we need to move beyond that. So in order to do that, we need to unpack it. And it means, what does biodiversity mean? So it means, okay, we need to look at what pressures, and again, I know I'm reiterating what's in the report, but this is key. If you know what pressures and dependencies you have on diversity, then you need to say, well, what are we gonna do about those? How are we gonna mitigate them? Then you need to take the process, okay, so then what would success look like? And then how do we go about measuring that success? And it's that logic, taking a logical approach, trying to unpack biodiversity for a given company or a given sector that to try and make it more manageable. And I honestly think in this case, it could be. My main recommendation would be really, you don't need to be monitoring every sort of species in the ocean around these sites. It, for a start, it's just incredibly difficult. You really don't need to be using all of these sorts of methods that are available. Focus in. What does the sector really say? Actually, you know what? That is a big impact. And you know, I know I said there's a lot of emphasis on mammals and birds, but obviously that's where you will also get more public support for efforts to reduce impacts on mammals and birds, but there are other areas as well. Some will still need to remain a focus. Make sure it's very clear what biodiversity you're worried about. And then just, again, it doesn't have to be a massive array of indicators. It's just focus on, on, on what's most important. So I guess that's my last message. I can honestly say working in different sectors as well, if you just take time to unpack biodiversity and think through what it means and think through monitoring logically, you're already halfway there. And it may not be quite as daunting as perhaps it first seems. Thanks a lot, PJ. I think these are some great messages that uh, everyone can leave here with today, at least I will, that um, yeah, we should approach this in a way that makes it more manageable for all of us and maybe we should all feel a bit safer in failing um, not be too afraid of it <laughs> um, thank you so much for the great report for the very insightful report um, that you have created for this um, thanks a lot for everyone else who joined here as well especially vivian antonio and tina for sharing your perspectives um, and thanks pj for the great presentation today um, just to reiter reiterate for everyone, you'll find the report from now on on our website. Um, we'll send you an email with the link after this, so you'll know where to look. Um, and I hope that we all stay in conversation about this topic and move a few steps forward very soon. Thanks a lot to everyone. Bye bye and have a great evening. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Steffi. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.